Okay, let us start. So welcome to lecture eight, stateful versus non-stateful programming. Right, we sort of define um, what stateful programming is, what non-stateful programming is. Stateful essentially is the are is that kind of programming that uses assignment, right? Whereas non-stateful does uh, not. Um, stateful, non-stateful programming, as we have seen, has a very nice, the very nice ability to deal with functions as first-class objects, right? And that leads to higher-order programming, right? Which seems to be a very elegant paradigm. So the question is, guys. You can take it outside if you want. Not compulsory to be here, right? Um, so, uh, um, right. So, so we have higher order programming, but the uh, interesting aspect is what happens if we mix higher order programming and and assignment, right? So we'll see that the effects are non-trivial. Um, there is one uh, aspect that I, uh, I still owe you from last lecture, as a matter of fact, which is procedure implementation. So that's what we're going to start today with. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about activation records, how those allow the implementation of recursion. Then last time we introduced tail call, uh, tail recursiveness, right? Tail recursion. Tail uh, recursion is a way of doing recursion that is, in fact, efficient and doesn't consume extra stack space. So we're going to see how that can be implemented in the context of activation records. And we're going to talk a bit about parameter passing, um, which is a bit of an obsolete um, um, uh, topic. Most people do it in a very specific way, parameter passing this way, this day. So there's no need to really talk um, about um, others other than for um, um, historical reasons. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's one thing that we want to, to see today. So nested procedures, higher programming, and assignment, and how this affects the rules for scoping. The last part of the lecture is going to be about a new language, the language OS, which we're going to use later for concurrency. So this one has a very interesting mix of stateful and non-stateful programming, right? It has uh, a way of mixing logic variables, the logic variables of prolog, with the ability to change the value for a variable. Well, actually, not really for a variable. We'll see how it works. And uh, combined later with concurrency, it will lead to a lot of very interesting examples. So uh, let's talk first about procedure uh, implementation. In procedure implementation, what do we need to worry about? What do we need to take care of? One aspect is parameter passing, right? So these are sort of things that we need to do in order. So first we need to pass the parameters. The actual arguments must be bound to the formal arguments. Then there needs to be local variable allocation. Actually, I uh, put them in, in uh, not quite the right order. Uh, so each invocation must have a separate set of uh, variables, of local variables, right? We know that especially from recursion. When we come back from the recursive call, we, found, we find the old values of the local variables. So we have to take care of that. We have to implement that. And then there's a return mechanism. So upon return from invocation, uh, control must be transferred back to the callee. Uh, and we need to have something for that as well. And the solution that is typically used is called the activation record, the use of the activation record. And that's what we're going to see Next. So let's work under the following assumption. We have a C program that we want translated into val, right? Vanilla assembly language. So when we have this setting, right, we, you may assume that we have a function that calls another function, all right? The function that calls another function is called the caller, and the function that is being called is called the callee in this terminology. And in C, we would simply write, let's say that the callee is called G here, right? So what we write at the caller side is G with some arguments, all right? Well, the val code that represents this high-level language call, 
He is actually divided into three parts. This, it will produce a lot of instructions, right? It's not, it will not be just one instruction. And there will be something that we call a prologue. There will be the effective call, and there will be an epilogue, right? At the effective call, all these are instructions, right? At the effective call, uh, the control will be transferred into the callee, right? And the callee, this function G, has a body, right? We open a brace, we write some code, we close the brace, right? So that body is translated here. Apart from the body, just to make the function work, we need to have a prologue and an epilogue here as well. All right, so there will be some code that you don't see from the high-level language. It doesn't have a correspondent into the high-level language, and it deals with the setup of the activation record, right? So this is how the control works. Uh, let me just change the color to, let's say, blue. We execute, get here, transfer the execution here, execute up to the return point. At the return point, we come back here and we keep executing, right? Exactly as you would expect at a high level language, uh, in, in a high level language program, right? Just that as, as we execute, there are these pieces of code that deal with the setup of the procedure, the setup of the activation record that you don't see in the high level language uh, code. There's the prologue of the caller, the prologue of the callee, only then the body of the procedure executes then there's an epilogue of the callee, then there's an epilogue of the caller, and then the function is, the, the procedure call is finished. Okay? Now, what we call activation record is built on the stack. And we have seen the stack in the tutorial in one of the previous lessons, right? The stack was pointed to by a, reg a register for the Pentium that register is called DSP. Um, all right, and uh, um, it's it's like a normal stack, like a normal linear stack. And this activation record will be will be allocated here. So somewhere here is the ESP that points to the uh, last allocated element on the stack. And this entire record, this entire set of bytes, represents the activation record. What do we find in there? Well, the most important things that we find are the arguments, the return address, and the local variables. Right? They will be placed in there. There are several other things that we aren't aware at the high level language level, at a, in a high level language. These registers that need to be saved, this is just for internal housekeeping of the compiler. Right, but we'll have to we'll have to sort of deal with that as well because we're going to see effectively code being translated into val. So there are some registers that are that must be saved by the caller and some registers that must be saved by the callee, and I'm going to uh, uh, explain that a bit uh, later. So essentially, if inside here, inside the body of the procedure, there's another call. There will be another activation record placed here with new arguments, return address, and local variables. Right? When we reach back here, when we reach back, so, so this goes here and comes back. When we come back, right, this activation record is, re, uh, is, is removed, is discarded, and then inside the rest of the body of the procedure, the, the old values are restored, so this is how the procedure keeps its uh, values of the local variables and of the arguments. Okay, let's try to see uh, what is done in each part of these, in each prologue and in each epilogue. So, in the color prologue, uh, well, one thing that is uh, done is save color registers, right? So, we'll, we're going to explain that later. Bind actual arguments to formal arguments, right? So in the activation record, as we'll see, each formal argument has a predefined offset. So it's a matter of placing the value of that argument, the actual value of that argument, at the predefined offset in this um, 
in this area right here in the activation record. Okay? Then set up the return address. How do we set up the return address? Well, we use this label that can be computed by the compiler, and exactly the address of that label is the return address. So that return address will be saved here in the activation record. The call is performed by simply executing a go to to the callee, right? So this callee will have a label, let's say G. All right, so perform call means go to G. Inside here, the callee has to save its own registers. Again, we're going to explain that a bit later. It has to allocate local variables. So at, this, at that point, this part of the activation record becomes set up. And then it can go on and execute the body of the procedure. All right, inside the body, a very important thing, right? This activation record will be pointed, well, as, as soon as we reach this point in the code, this activation record will be pointed to by a register, which is typically called the frame register. For the Pentium architecture, just, uh, architecture that, that register is EBP. But in general, all architectures will have a register designated as a frame pointer, and it points to the register. Now, you'll find it a bit strange in the example that we uh, do today, the frame pointer does not point to the base of the activation record. It points somewhere to the middle of the activation record. There's a variety of solutions on how to um, uh, organize the activation record, and we're, going, we're just discussing one of them, right? The fact that we adopt this solution is because C allows a variable number of arguments, and again, I'm going to explain that later. Just keep that in mind, right? But um, EBP points to this activation record in such a way that every argument has a fixed positive offset from EBP, and each local variable has a fixed negative offset from EBP. All right? And that's very helpful. So if later we're going to add another activation record, EBP is going to point somewhere here, and there will be some area in the activation record that will hold the arguments, and EBP plus something. So we'll see EBP plus 8 is going to be the first argument, EBP plus 12 the second argument, EBP plus 16 the third argument, and so on and so forth. Whereas the local variables will be somewhere in this, so this is arguments, this is local variables. Local variables will be in the, with negative offsets, and we'll see soon that uh, I think EBP minus 12 is the first local variable, EBP minus 16 is the second local variable, EBP minus 20 is the third, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's just a rough diagram, and we're going to refine it further. Okay, just be prepared. Now, let's talk about a bit about the registers. Uh, the compiler will use the registers to store temporary variables, temporary results, right? Pentium has six, six actually has eight registers, and I think I, we've, we've discussed all of them, right? EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI, ESP, and EBP. The last two have fixed roles. ESP is the stack pointer, EBP will be used as the frame point. The other six can be used as general purpose registers. And the compi a compiler, not ours, ours we didn't make too much use of the, we adopted a very naive and a rather inefficient compilation scheme, but in general the compiler will try to take a, as much uh, advantage as it, it's, it is possible of the registers, right? It will try to store temporary values into the registers and avoid storing and loading into memory as much as possible, right? Access to registers is much faster than access to memory, okay? So at the point of the call, right? So at the point of the call, this is the call. This is the call. This is the code for the call, right? So at this point, some of the registers may contain important information that the compiler wants preserved. So then 
since the CoLE may be compiled with a different compiler. Remember that about C, right? I may put one function in one file, another function in another file, compile file one with compiler one of C, compile file one with compile two with compiler two of C as well, right? Let's say GCC and the Intel Whatcom compiler, for instance. Link them together, it should work. But the problem is that at the point of compiling this part of the code, the compiler can make no assumptions about what's going to happen in the colleague. All right? And the compiler may have some important information in the registers here that it wants preserved. All right? So you'd say, well, let the caller save all the registers so that it can make sure, right? or at least all the registers that contain important information, right? But it may be the case that a colleague doesn't use any of the registers, or it only uses one register, right? And doesn't use, so then the save that, this, that happens here may be redundant. So there's this important convention on registers. There are, of these six registers, there are three that have, have to be saved by the caller, and there are three that have to be saved by the colleague. Right, it works in the following way. Uh, let me see if I remember correctly. Um, right, so EAX, ECX, and EDX are caller saved. And it goes the, fo the following way. If the caller expects these, um, um, expects these registers to be preserved, it must save them itself. So here, Save EAX, ECX, EDX, but do that only if you're expecting, you're, you need the values that are currently in those registers. The rest of the registers, EBX, ESI, and EDI, are supposed to be called to be saved by the callee. So the caller ex expects the following thing. I'm not going to save these three green registers but I still expect them to be unchanged when, you call, when, when, when the when control comes back. So then the colleague must do what? If the colleague uses any of these three registers, then it must save them here. So this saving of registers, it has to be done only if the registers are used and has to be done according to the convention, right? And if the registers are not used at all, then we don't need to say, okay? So that's gonna impact our code later. So we'll, we'll see an example where we're gonna oversave, we're gonna save everything just to be on the safe side. Then as we develop the code, we'll, we're, we're gonna realize that actually we, don't, we could have not saved anything. And then we're gonna see an example where we don't save anymore because we know that we don't need the registers at all, right? So keep in that in, in mind. All right, so let's, take a more concrete example and let's see exactly how the activation record works. So we're going to have two pieces of code. This is the caller. So we have some function with four arguments, right, which are integers and the actual arguments are one, two, three, four, and we expect a result in R, right? And th this is the callee, right? There's the function f with four formal arguments three local variables, there's some body, and then the function ends somewhere, okay? And of course, there must be some return statement somewhere inside, right? So, what's gonna be in the activation record? Well, if you look at the previous diagram, right, we have the stack, and, and how do we create the activation record? By pushing stuff on the stack. So we're going to save EAX, ECX, EDX because these are the color saved registers first. So we're going to do push EAX, push ECX, push EDX. They are saved. Later, we can actually retrieve them because the values are there. So now we are allowed to change these registers. Then these are the values of the arguments. So we're going to push them and we're going to push them in reverse order. So we're going to push D, 
then push C, push B, push A. Why is that? Because C has a allows uh, procedures with a variable number of arguments, and we want to have access to the first argument all the time, right? And we'll see how that happens, how that, that allows. But for the time being, just remember that the arguments are pushed in reverse order. In reverse order. Then, somewhere here, there's a label containing the return address. The address of that label will be pushed on the stack here. And then, this is the part that is set up by the caller, right? Including the return address, up to the return address. Then, Control is transferred to the procedure. We perform the go to procedure, right? And then we uh, um, do the activation uh, records setup done by the caller, the colleague, sorry, right? So these are the three registers saved by the, sorry. It will save four registers. So these are the three registers saved by the, by the um, uh, colleague. But we also need to save the old frame pointer because we are in the middle of creating a new, a new activation record, right? And later, when we discard the current activation record, we'll have to know where to, where to restore the old frame pointer. And then we're going to have the local variables, x, y, and z. And we don't push anything there. We just decrease the stack pointer by 12 in this case to make room for three variables. Now, once BP, EBP has been saved, EBP will be changed to reference exactly this memory point. So EBP is a pointer to the activation record, but it points in the middle, doesn't point at the base. The important aspect here is now, let's see what are the offsets of all the activation record elements with respect to EBP, all right? So the first argument is at EBP plus 8. The second argument is at EBP plus 12. The third argument is at EBP plus 16. The fourth argument is at EBP plus 20. The first local variable is at EBP minus 16. The second argument is at EBP minus 20. The third argument is at EBP minus 24. These offsets are constant. No matter where I create the activation record, I am going to have constant means of referring to my local variables and my arguments. This is the most important outcome of using the activation record. Now, if I'm, if, what the compiler is going to do what? Well, it's going to compile the body of the procedure, whatever is here. Every time it sees an A, it translates the reference to A into this, right? And that's going to be constant no matter what. So I don't have a constant address for A. A is not going to be placed in the same place in memory every single time. But it will have the same expression. It will translate into the same expression throughout the entire body of the procedure. So then the compiler can work very nicely. right? Every time it sees a reference to B, it will translate it into this. Every time it sees a reference to X, it will translate it into this. OK? Is this clear? Okay, so let's go now through a full-fledged example. All right, so let's continue to assume that this is our caller. And now I filled in a body for the colleague. I have three statements inside, right? X is assigned A plus B plus C. Y is assigned B plus C plus D. Z is assigned X divided by Y. And we are returning two times X. Actually, four statements. So let's see what happens at the caller side, how the call will be translated, and then how the callee will be translated into that. All right? 
So remember the, the push instructions, right? The push instruction, we are, we don't have a specific push instruction or valve, so we're doing uh, this combination of, of decreasing the ESP and then storing whatever we want to push at the memory cell um, uh, referenced by ESP. Right? So these will be effectively a push EAX. So if you look on the previous slide, right, this is, uh, all these three images are taken from the previous slide, but just made a bit smaller, right? So we're going to push EAX, push ECX, push EDX. You see them here. Then we're going to push the arguments, the argument values, 4, 3, 2, 1, on the stack, right? Then EAX has been saved, so can be used. So EAX will uh, be loaded with the return address, and the return address will be pushed on the stack as well. Then we can perform the transfer. We do go to F. So from here, we go here, right? And I'm going to go now to the next slide and continue with the execution of F, right? And then come back and do the epilogue here, right? So remember that this is the prologue of the caller. This is the actual call. We're going to execute the prologue of the callee, all right? Then we're going to execute the body of the colleague and execute the epilogue. So remember, at the point when we perform the call, right, we have filled up the activation record up, up to here. OK? So we continue on. We save EBP, and we load EBP with ESP. At this point, the new value of EBP points to the current activation record. So far, we have been using, we have been building the new activation record, but EBP was pointing to the old activation record. So from this point on, EBP points to the new activation record and points in the middle, right? And then we have the callee saved registers, all right? And we actually don't need to do these saves. We'll see later, but we're just doing it to be faithful to the compilation scheme that we have um, uh, agreed on. And then we allocate space for local variables. The local variables don't have initial values. Therefore, we just reserve space. OK? Then we have four statements. So one, two, three, four. All right? And I'm not using the compiler I gave you last time to compile these statements. I'm just doing some sort of translation. All right? And you see that the only register I'm using is EAX. So we're doing what? Uh, we're, we're, we're computing A plus B plus C, right? So the important thing here is what? Because the way that we translate we, is not uh, that important. But it's important that every time I reference A, I use this expression, which is this expression right here, right? Every time I reference B, I use this expression. Every time I reference C, I use this, this expression, right? So the compiler's job becomes easy. Every symbol translates into something that is fixed. It doesn't matter that it, it's not a constant address, but it's a fixed expression, okay? And so that was for the, so this is the first assignment. The, the first assignment that is here. The second assignment, the second one is here. And we do the same thing, right? So this is B. This is C, this is D, this is Y, this is X, X is here, Y is here, okay? And further, uh, what's the next one? Z equals X divided by Y, so this is X, this is Y, this is Z, right? And finally, we have to produce a return value. Now, Pentium and many uh, uh, architectures will reserve a register as the, as, the play, as the holder of the return value. And for the Pentium, that register is EAX, right? So we're going to store our return value into EAX, and we leave it here. Now it's time to do the epilogue. The epilogue will undo what the prologue has done. And it goes for both the caller and the callee. The epilogue of the callee will undo what the, epilogue of, what the prologue of the callee has done.
right? So what we're going to do? We're going to reverse this. So you see it here, right? Then we're going to pop all the registers. So you see ESI is popped, EDI is popped, EBX is popped, EBP is popped. So EBP now is already back to the previous activation record. Is back to the caller's activation record. And then at the top of the stack, we have the return address, right? But when we come back, we want to have the stack restored to whatever it was there before. So then we're going to increase ESP by four, and we're going to perform this computed go to that will take us back to the return address of in, inside the caller, right? And notice now that we may call from many places the same procedure, and every time we return, we return to the place of call. It can return to many places. So this is the epilogue of the callee, and now we go back to the caller, and once we have executed the computed go to, we're back here. So the epilogue of the caller will undo what the prologue of the caller has set up, right? So it clears the arguments. See, no need to really put zeros there or anything. Just restore the stack. And then pop the two registers. But remember that we can't pop all the three registers. EAX contains the return value. So we have to save the, restore, the, the return value to wherever it is to be placed, R. Remember that EBP is already back to the caller's frame uh, activation record, right? Activation record is also called frame sometimes, or the frame is part of an activation record, can be part of an activation record. There's a part of an activation record that is, would be called frame, and that's why we call um, the frame pointer frame pointer, and not activation record pointer. Uh, and we're assuming that in the uh, activation record of the caller, R is mapped into this address. I'm just assuming, right? I'm making an assumption here. Okay, so you see the assumption explained here. So we're saving EAX, which is the return value, in its rightful place, and then we can restore EAX to the value that was there before the call. Okay? Now you'll obviously notice that we haven't used, except for EAX, we haven't used any of the registers. And we can also wonder, was EAX holding anything important at this point in the program? Because if it didn't, right, we might as well not have saved it, right? And the compiler in general will optimize this. So it's very likely that the, optimize, the, the compiler will do away with these three instructions and will also do away with these three instructions, right? The pops, the pushes and the pops, they will be they will be uh, um, avoided, right? But in general, it's not bad if we do save them just to be on the safe side. All right? It will just make the program you know, less efficient but not incorrect. So often you won't know in advance. If you write by hand, you won't know in advance whether you need to save them or not, right? So maybe you want to save them. Um, Okay, is this clear? All right, take 30 seconds to let all this sink in. Ask any questions if you develop any doubts in the 30 seconds. Yes? This one. Uh -huh. Oh, well, that depends on how you want to implement. Um, uh, so I'm saving EBP, and ESP is now exactly on the return address, right? It's exactly here. This is where ESP points to right now, right? Now, um, the Pentium, in fact, has an instruction called the return, 
which performs these two, in, these two things simultaneously, right? And when we come back to the caller, the, the stack for the caller is so that the return address is not there anymore. All right? So whether you want to abide by this convention or not, because you could, you could actually shift things around a bit, right? You could, you could do the ESP plus equal 4 at the caller, not at the colleague. So what we're doing here is the following. We're sort of erasing the return address from the stack. So I'm incrementing ESP plus 4. Then when I perform the go to, because the top of the stack doesn't contain the return address, but the return address has not been erased effectively. It's still accessible, and I'm using ESP minus 4 here to compensate for the plus plus that I have performed. Right? Normally, you would, like, you would want to use MESP here. Right. So the question, your question is, do you want to do this ESP plus equal four here, or do you want to do it? Do you want to do it here? Right, because at the point when we reach here, it may be the case if we're not doing it at the colli, we will still the stack will still be pointing at the. Uh, return address, which we must discard, right? So I could do the ESP plus equal 4 there, or I could do it here. I have to do it somewhere. And, and it so happens that, that the pendulum actually will do the ESP plus 4. Simu uh, uh, right, so so the the Pentium will do this in one instruction. So there's two instructions there. So unfortunately, my val is not expressive enough to completely reflect what the Pentium is doing. But the Pentium will do exactly those two instructions simultaneously in one single instruction. All right. So I wanted to simulate that. There's the ret instruction, which performs a return. So it takes the address from the stack, it increments the stack, and then it jumps. Yes? Yes, exactly, precisely for that reason, right? So the activation records will stack up. And we'll see an example of recursion with activation records um, later, right? So. So you're going to have, like, if you have 20, a chain of 20 calls, F1 calls F2, which calls F3, which calls F4, which calls, right? So you build the activation record for F1. When you call F2, you build another activation record on top of, uh, for F2, on top of the one for F1, right? And they keep stacking up. And then, so if you have, this is the stack, and you have the activation records, right? The last one, EBP, will be here. And precisely, the memory location that EPP points to will contain essentially a link going back, right? And this will be a link going back, right? So every time, so the activation records will in fact be linked. And every time you're finished with an activation record, you restore its own value and you push it back and, and have access to the old activation record of the caller. Yes, EBP. Okay, let me write this is the stack. Let's say this is my current activation record, right? My current EBP is here. I call another function. So I'm going to start building another activation record. And at some point, I'm going to save the old EBP somewhere here. And the new value of EBP will point here, right? So essentially, this becomes a link to here. Right? So um, let me change color. And so this is the activation record, new activation record. Right? And this becomes a link. And when we build another one, ah, 
sorry, I right. So so uh... right. So this is the old value that points here, and then when we build a new one. The new EBP that will be stored here, so EBP will be pointing here, right? And this will store the old value of the EBP, which will point here. Right? So you go to EBP, the location that EBP exactly points to, EBP plus zero, will point to the previous activation record. And if you dereference that, you'll go to the two, le two, two, two levels ago, right? The one that was there two levels ago. All right? Okay, let's see what happens for recording. So uh, a few Im uh, important points that I have mentioned, but it's never um, a bad thing to summarize. Uh, so each function invocation creates a new activation record, and that will be discarded when the function returns. The activation records are allocated on the stack, and this is natural because it follows the sequencing of calls, right? F1 calls F2, which calls F3, which calls F4, right? So activation record one, and then activation record two on top of a, uh, one, the third one on top of the second one, and so on. And when we perform the, re the, uh, the returns, they will be discarded in, the, in reverse order of how they were created. Uh, ARs are pointed to by a frame pointer, which is typically implemented as a pure re register. This is EBP in the Pentium, right? But any architecture would have its own registers uh, set aside for this um, role. Uh, and um, there are many ways of organizing an activation record. We have chose the one that is specific to C. The EBP points to the middle of the activation record, and the arguments are are on the activation record in reverse order. And if you think about that, this is important in order to allow variable number of arguments because the first argument of the function, which is the one you always want to access, you don't know how many arguments you have, but you always want to be able to access at least the first argument. And if, if they're pushed in reverse order in the current scheme, the first argument will be at EBP plus eight always. Whereas if they would be pushed in direct order, EPP plus eight will be the last argument, right? So where's the first? You don't know because you don't know how many arguments were. I mean, you don't always know because you don't know how many arguments were given to the function, right? So you have a problem. So you want them to be in reverse order and you want uh, them to, uh, you want the activation, uh, the frame pointer to point in the middle. Um, all right. Also, you have uh, more freedom in in act, in, in allocating uh, local variables, uh, in uh, because there's always space down for more um, uh, local variables, and the compiler will allocate temporary local variables that you have not declared to hold uh, intermediate results when it runs out of registers. Let's say you have a lot of very complicated expressions. You only have six registers. There's not enough room to hold all the intermediate results you might have. And every once in a while, the compiler needs more storage for the temporary, for, for those intermediate results. Where would it put them? On the stack just below the local variables. So it will go to EBP minus something. And because there's a lot of space there, right? Those variables, temporary variables can be allocated, but it's important that your local variables are still at fixed offsets, right? So that also comes from the fact that the uh, uh, EBP points to the middle, right? So it's sort of like, uh, right, EBP points to the middle, and you have an indeterminate amount of space here for arguments, but always the first argument is at fixed offset. You have an indeterminate amount of space here for local variables, but your first local variable is always here. Okay? So those are the advantages of pointing in the middle. 
but, but there are compilers that would work completely different. So if you have fixed number of arguments, it doesn't really matter whether you, um, uh, in which order you put them, right? But then the compiler needs to do what? There's an important aspect that a compiler needs to do and which is not done by a C compiler. Think of Java. In Java, if uh, you have two files, right? So uh, you have two classes. So class one has, uh, class. you have class F, right? Which has a little method F here. And this is in one file, f.java. Then you have class G, which has a little method G inside here in another file. And F calls G. Right, F calls G. When you compile f.java, what does the compiler need to see? G.java, right? The compiler will not compile your f.java if it cannot look into f into g.java. It will have to actually go recursively and compile g.java first, and then go and compile f.java. C does not do that. C will compile this independently, and this independently, well, assuming you know the correspondent uh, C concept, right? And uh, then it will just assume that it's the programmer's job to match the arguments correctly, right? And it will have to provide a mechanism so that this function may be declared here with a variable number of arguments, this G. This G is declared here with a variable number of arguments, and here G will have a number of arguments that a compiler cannot predict, right? In Java, this is not a case. In Java, it, the, the, uh, the compiler will look at the definition, it will look at the call, and will make sure that the number of arguments match, right? And at least in the, previous, in the early versions of Java, variable number of arguments were not allowed. Now they are, so they have uh, uh, come up with some sort of, but still, the compiler needs to see this before compiling this, right? So this simplifies the activation record a lot because you have that information. You always know how many arguments are, there are going to there are going to be. Okay, what's the greatest greatest advantage of the activation record? It's this one. So this makes the compiler job easier, right? The fact that every identifier in the procedure is translated into a fixed expression. That fixed expression will not go to the, to the same address every single time, but it is something that a compiler can use for translation. Is this clear? Okay. So. Let's see how a recursive function works, right? So now the caller is also the colleague, right? So uh, um, you'll notice that um, we're going to have a prolog of the caller of the colleague, colleague prolog, and here, just before performing this, the recursive call to fib, we're going to have a prolog of the caller and an epilogue of the caller, right? So let's see what happens here. Um, so as, as, as before, I'm going to save all the registers, right? Um, so the callee prologue, the ABBP, the ABBX, EDA, uh, EDI, ESI, allocate space for local variables. And, and uh, notice that I have uh, uh, introduced local variables uh, even though they are a bit redundant, I could have just returned fib m minus one plus fib m minus two, but I just want to have the experience of uh, having local variables so you see how they're handled. Okay? Um, so we have the if test, right? And notice how the return statement is implemented. Right? We load EAX with the return value, which is specified here, and we can't just get out of the function at that point. Because before getting out of function, we have to execute the epilogue. So we have to jump to the epilogue. This label will point to the epilogue of the call lead. Then, right, if we have made it up to this point, 
we have to translate these two expressions, these two calls, right? So we have to be prepared to perform a recursive call to fib and minus one. So this will be the prolog of the caller, and this will be the epilogue of the caller. All right? So remember, the caller and the callee are the same now. So this is the prologue of the callee. So we're going to prologue of the caller. We're saving the registers. All right? We uh, start uh, pushing the arguments. Actually, there's a single argument, right? So we have to compute the value of n minus 1. So notice that EAX is taken from this guy. This guy points to the, always, the first argument. There's only one argument, and that's the first. We compute n minus 1 here, and we push n minus 1 on the stack. Then we push the return address. Then we go to fib. Um, then we go to fib, right? So we recursively come back here. That's what we do. Upon return, right, we execute the epilogue of the caller. So we clear the arguments. There's only one argument, so we clear four bytes. Then we restore edx and uh, e cx. I forgot to change the comment here. Got and pasted. But you can see that ECX is restored here. Then we remember that by now EBX has been restored to the activation record of the caller. So we want to store this in X, right? So this is X. And this is the result coming from the recursive call. So the result goes into X. Okay? And finally, we can restore EX. But again, you will notice that none of the registers bears any important role. Actually, I could have completely uh, not, not saved any of the registers. All the push of the, and, and pops of the registers can be removed from the program and the program work correctly, right? We're just doing it to comply with the compilation scheme that we have uh, chosen uh, and to you know, showcase the fact that this is how things work. Uh, so. The second recursive call is here, right? Again, save registers. Um, we have to compute n minus 2. So this, again, is n minus 2, right? It is pushed. It is pushed on the stack. Then we have to push the new return address, this one that is here, right? So we push it, and then we go to fib recursively again, right? When we come back from the return call, we clear the arguments. All right, we restore the ECX and EDX2 of the registers. Before restoring EAX, we have to save the return value. The return value is here. This is Y, this guy. OK? And um, uh, then we can restore EAX. Then when we reach the, re then there's the return statement. So we have to compute X plus Y. So this is X, this is Y. They're added together. The return value will always be in EX. So it's already in EX. We leave it there. All right? And then we have the epilogue of the callee. This is the callee epilogue, right? So two local variables will be cleared. We restore registers, and uh, including EBP. And then we jump back to the return address, wherever that was. OK? So this is the translation of a recursive function. And this is why recursion works. Because every time we perform a recursive call, we create an activation record. And when we come back, we go back to the previous, to the whatever activation record we had before, and we retrieve the old values of our variables. OK? So in a little animation, if we are to compute Fibonacci of 3, right? The first activation record we created with an n, argument n equals to 3, and unknown values for x and y. And as we call, we create a new activation record with an argument of 2, right? Fib 2 will call fib 1, so a new activation record with an argument of 1. When it's 1, so, so look what happens, right? When it's 1, it immediately returns. The return value is equal to n. So this value will be returned into the x here, right? So that's what you see. That return from the call, the activation record has been discarded, the previous activation record has been restored, and the return value has been recorded in x, in the x 
of that activation record. You see, there's another X here, which is still unknown. So then, FIB2 will call FIB0, right? So there's an argument of 0, and this again will, will return right away, sorry, it will return right away, and this value goes into Y. Okay, so see what happens as I move on to the next slide. The current activation record is discarded, but Y gets the value 0. Now the sum of X and Y, the sum of X and Y will go into this X, right? So, current activation record discarded, but the X at the first uh, activation record um, gets the value 1. FIB3 still has to call FIB2. Sorry, FIB1. It, it has called FIB2 and it, it will call FIB1. So we have an argument of 1. X and Y are not yet known. And when N is 1, this value will go into Y. Right? So, y is 1, x is 1 now, and finally we can return from pip3, so the activation record of pip3 is discarded, and it returns true to the outer environment, right? So, even when we have tree recursion, works fine, right? And we don't have a tree of activation records. We still have a stack of activation records which grows and shrinks, right? This clear? Wonderful. Questions? Okay. Tail call optimization. So Let's take factorial, and not any factorial. The factor, a factorial that is that is uh, that has tail recursion. So r let me remind you what we mean by tail recursion. It means that the recursive call that you see here is the last thing to be done in the current call. Which means that when we come back from this recursive call, we're going to further return to the uh, upper level, right? And because of that, right before the call, the values of the internal variables and arguments are already not need, not no need to be preserved, right? I when I when I reached with the execution at this point, I could discard the storage for n and k in advance. Right? So typically what we do what we do is we keep the activation record around until the recursive call returns. But when I come back from the recursive call, I'm not going to use N and K because I'm just going to return further. So I could potentially right, um, uh, 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 erase the storage for N and K, erase the current activation record before the recursive call. Or better still, I could reuse it, not delete it and create another one, but reuse it. All right. So this is the factorial without the tail core optimization. And what I did here was optimize away all the register saves, because as we have seen in the previous slide, we don't, we haven't used much. Right? We're not very good at optimization, so we haven't optimized very much and since we're not using the registers, no point in saving them. They were taking up quite a bit of code. So this is the factorial without uh, with, without uh, the uh, the uh, register saves, but without tail call optimization, right? So it proceeds it proceeds as as usual. Uh, so what we do is we save EBP. Uh, there's no local variables, so there's nothing to create here. We can go directly into the code. This is uh, N, all right, and uh, this is K here. So this entire thing is the body. And we have a recursive call right here. We have to set up the values of um, uh, N minus 1. So we compute N minus 1 here and we push it. We push N minus 1. We uh, 
retrieve the value of n again, right? We, so from n minus 1, we go back to n. And then the new value of k is k times n, right? So eax will be multiplied with the current value of k and push, push on the stack, right? So as to uh, have the new arguments n minus 1 and n times k, right? And then we save the return address and we go to factorial. Right, and then we have factorial exit that um, uh, performs the epilogue of the colleague. Now, instead of setting up a new EBP, we could just reuse the current activation record. We can just keep the EBP where it is, all right? And uh, instead of pushing, just perform assignments. All right, so there are a few places where we have made uh, changes, right? Uh, so notice that instead of pushing, instead of pushing n minus one, I'm setting the new value of n to be n minus one. And instead of pushing the value of n times k, I'm setting the value of k to become n times k. I don't have to save the return address, and I can just jump where? Not to the function, because the function performs the prologue. Since I haven't performed the caller prologue, I should avoid the callee prologue as well. All right? So I reuse the current activation record. And this will use constant stack space. Okay? The compiler can do this automatically. Well, some compiler. The C compiler, uh, the C compiler, it has the optimization, but it's not sound, so you're doing it at your own risk. Uh, there are a few optimizations that are like that in GCC. Um, all right. I, I won't go in there because it's um, it's um, too much, too long a discussion. So. Uh, I, we can take it offline if you want. Um, all right, so do you at least get, in general, the in principle, what's happening? All right, so we're reusing the current activation record instead of creating a new one. We still need to tackle the current activation record on the first call and on the first, on the last exit. All right, but all the middle calls and returns, they can be handled by effectively looping around, right? So this becomes a loop. There's no new activation record being created. There's only a reuse of the current one. And, all right, effectively this becomes a while. Okay. Okay, so this is it about procedure implementation. There's a lot more to discuss, actually, but it's enough for this level. Okay? So soon we're going to discuss nested procedures, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point you to wonder what the activation record should look like in that case. We're not going to do, we're, gonna, we're not going to discuss that, but just, just wonder. Just think about it, all right? So things can get a lot more complicated, and, and we'll see. Uh, in a minute, what kind of language constructs will make it will make it more complicated? Okay, can we move on? So parameter parsing. Um, what we have seen and what we are very used to is call by value, right? The value of the values of the arguments are placed in the AR. Okay, which means what that. If we make changes inside a procedure to the arguments, those changes will not be reflected when you go back to the calling environment. Right? So in C, if I have x equals 1, and then I have f applied to x, I'm not expecting x to be changed upon return from f, right? Right, so that's by value. I take the value of the argument, put, put it in the activation record, 
any changes to the argument inside F will be changes on the copy that exists in the activation record and not changes on the variable. And that's what we've seen in a previous example. Another type is called by reference, all right, where changes will be reflected. So I have x equals 1. I call fx. Inside f, the argument is incremented, let's say. We come out of f, and suddenly the value of x is 2, all right? That's possible. So the advantage of call by, what happens in that case? The address of the argument, especially if the argument is just a variable, the address of the argument is passed into the activation record. And on every access of that argument, the address is dereferenced. Right? Advantage number one is the activation record is kept small. I may have a very large argument, but the address is a small amount of information that can be easily placed in the activation record. Disadvantage, I have to dereference on every access. It's longer to dereference. There's another disadvantage that is not so obvious, right? In a concurrent setting, a concurrent thread, which may belong to another user, may see intermediate values, because this may be a global variable. F modifies X, but it modifies it in several stages. So intermediate values of X may be observed by a concurrent thread. And that's a potential security issue that we may want to avoid, OK? So there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, the, the, uh, but this is not very widely used, because it can be easily simulated in many languages, right? There is, uh, because there are either reference types or because they, the languages have pointers. So if I want uh, changes from inside a function to be propagated outside, I can very easily pass in the address of x, and I can keep the call by value policy. Now, instead of call by reference, we could be using call by value return, which does which has pretty much the same effect, right? But it does it in the following way. It makes a copy of the value and puts it in the activation record, right? Then the function proceeds and makes its own changes to the arguments. And then the epilog of the caller copies back the values of the arguments into their original places. All right? Can you get how this works? So you put the values as in call by value, but after you have returned, the activation record may contain modified values of the arguments because the function may have made changes. So the epilog of the caller takes those values and puts them back in the, to the, the sources, right? So you may still see if x is incremented inside f, you may still see x equals 2 at the end. But a concurrent thread will not notice intermediate changes. So the security issue is resolved. So that's the great advantage of this approach. It resolves the security issue whereby a concurrent thread may observe intermediate values of a global variable as a secret mysterious function f is executed. Okay? Obviously, potentially large overheads. You have to copy and copy back. And finally, call by name. Call by name is used in macro expansion. All right? So you know the define directives in, in C. Right? You can define, let's say, min of AB to be what? A less than B, question mark A, colon B. Right? Looks like a procedure. It's not, because when min of 1 and 2 appears in the text, when you have min, let's say you have min of 1 plus 2 and 3 plus 4 here, right? What happens is 1 plus 2 is not computed, 3 plus 4 is not computed. Instead, this expression is generated where A is textually replaced by 1 plus 2 and B is textually replaced by 3 plus 4. So then, 1 plus 2 and 3 plus 4 may appear in many places, and you may have to compute the same expression multiple times. Right? 
However, it can perform replacement inside replacement, and, and with recursion, it can lead to very interesting. Uh, so LaTeX is a macro-based uh, language, for instance. And uh, uh, this kind, I mean, the, uh, there are examples when it, it can prove to be very useful. Now, uh, Haskell circumvents that. So Haskell uses call by name in a, you know, in a very special fashion, but adds memoization to it. So once an expression is computed, the value is cached. Whenever you try to compute the same expression again, it checks whether it has been computed and a value exists, and it uses the value uh, of that expression. Now, this can work only in a language without what? Louder. Assignment, right? Which Haskell is. Haskell is the only language we know that does not have assignment. All the other languages have a backdoor for assignment. They, it's maybe not the main feature, but there's a backdoor for it, right? And because of that, it cannot really use, or it can use, um, uh, actually, OCaml and Scheme both all can use lazy evaluation, but in a very, you know, it's it's not a main feature again, right? So and care must be taken when um, lazy evaluation and assignment are combined because the results are not well. Care must be uh, taken to avoid simultaneous use of uh, lazy evaluation and assignment. We'll see more about that later. Okay, so that was procedures. All right, um, the general, the mainstream kind of parameter passing is uh, by value for any data type that fits into a register and by reference for anything that does not, that is larger than that. Um, all right, so, uh, 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 but not in C. So C passes just by value. Java has a mixture of uh, passed by value, passed by reference, right? Objects will be passed by a reference. All right, next topic, nested procedure. So we'll go, we're, we're gonna go and, and explore the interaction between stateful programming and non-stateful programming. Um, so this is one aspect that schemers should be very familiarized with. We can define a procedure inside another procedure. We define F. And inside F, we define G. And inside G, we reference a variable that is not inside the scope of G. It comes from the outside, right? So X is, in, is from the outside scope. We're accessing this X. And we may, what would be the use of that? Well, it may be as a helper. Sometimes it's as a helper. We just call it inside. We compute some helper computation, right, and we perform some helper computation, and that's it. But sometimes we can be, like, really tricky and return G from inside. So now I can call F with the value 3. The return is going to be that version of G. So this H is going to be that version of G where X has been already bound to 3. So any calls to H will increase the argument by three. All right? And the same can be done in OCaml. All right, so this would be the syntax. This is Python, right? Do I need to tell you the languages or you know by now? Same thing in Scheme, right? The same thing in C, surprisingly. But it's not standard C. It's an extension of GCC. So let's look at a C example because this is probably the most striking, right? I'm defining F. F is going to return the address of G, right? So I have to come up with a correct return uh, type for F. F is a function, right? Is a function that takes an argument in X and returns a pointer to a function that returns int, right? Inside F, but it's the same as this thing. Same as that thing, right? So if you can write it in Python, and I'm asking you to write in C, then you're suddenly, oh, these types are so complicated. You have to be able to write it, right? Same thing. So inside we define 
int g int y, we return x plus y. Notice again that we're accessing we're accessing the argument of x, right? And we're returning the address of g. And um, uh, in main, right, we assign h to be f applied to 3. h will be that version of g for which x is 3 already, right? x is bound to 3. So it will increase its argument. So if we perform these printouts, we're going to print 5 here and 7, right? Okay? What's the implication of that? So the question is, what if we assign to x now? Inside g. Possible or not possible? Possible. So, let's look at another version. The easiest is the Python. Right? But the Python has a little catch. So, in, in, when, I, when I perform an assignment of a new variable, that variable typically is declared as a new variable in the most innermost, inner, innermost scope. To access a variable that is in, a, in an outer scope, I have to perform this declaration, no local x. So then it will go and look for an x in the outer scope as opposed to declaring a <coughs> local x. So with this declaration, we're going to be accessing this x. And what we're doing here is we're, we're saying x is assigned x plus y, return x. This is in g. The return value of f is g. Right? So it's pretty much as the one before, but now we're assigning to x. But notice that x is not defined inside g. So now h, we assign it to f of assigned to 1. So it's that version of g where x is 1. And then we call h5. We're going to get 6 for the first time. Later we call h5 again. We're going to get 11. h5 again, we're going to get 16. So you see the value of x which originally was 1, because this is what we're returning, x, right? Now it has been increased to 6, then later to 11, later to 16. Where is x? Well, we've just done activation record. Where is that? What is x? Not can't be inside f. It's in the activation record of f. Right? But what we have learned in the first part of the lecture is that the activation record of a function is discarded upon return. Does it look like in this case the activation record of f has been discarded? Obviously not, right? It has to be sitting around somewhere in memory, right? Now, the activation record of G, how does G access X? What do we need inside the activation record of G to be able to access X? Louder. Yeah, but, but, but things don't, don't go that easily, right? The compiler needs to have a, a systematic way of doing that. So it needs a link to the activation record of f. Okay? So now, right, we had bp, bp was there, and would point to the previous activation record in the stack, right? But we need yet another link that points to the activation record of the enclosing scope. Right? So this we typically call static link, and this what we call dynamic link. Right? So the activation record needs to be enhanced. I'm just telling this you to, to uh, this to you to be aware. So this is not this is not examinable. All right? <coughs> 
just to be aware that the activation record can suddenly get a lot more complicated. This nested procedures is very, is very standard in, so I can, I can make it work in Java as well, right? It's very standard in uh, most languages, all right? And it complicates the language implementation very, very much, right? So what we have done by describing the activation record uh, in the first part of the lecture is just scratching the surface. There's a lot more stuff that we need to put in the activation record, and there's a lot more housekeeping that we need to perform. Okay? Just remember that in case you, uh, you know, take a more advanced course later. So uh, this is scheme, right? How do we do it in scheme? Scheme is assignment is this set band instruction, right? And we're assigning x to be x plus y, right? G returns x, f returns g. Right, and then everything works in the same way. H, we uh, uh, assign it to F1, H5 will be 6, H5 again will be 11, and so on. So, X is hidden. That's the important thing. Right, and this allows implementation of encapsulation and data hiding, which is a precursor to object oriented programming. Okay? So before object-oriented programming ha was, uh, was uh, uh, around, people were fiddling with this kind of techniques in order to implement encapsulation and data hiding in many languages. This was, this was the feature that they were using. So remember this, right? It's tricky. Uh, uh, so this is essentially higher order programming with assignment. And remember that because of this trickiness, typically you don't want to mix them, right? So it, it's unlikely. The, uh, the level of trickiness will outweigh the benefits, the potential benefits, because if you pass your code to somebody else, they will have to spend a lot of time understanding what's going on. Now, an interesting aspect that is raised by uh, this problem is that of scoping. All right, so let's take again the function that we have discussed and well, let's take the Python version. And I'm going to, before creating H, I'm going to add this declaration of X. And we have already noticed in, the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in discussing this code that when we call H, right, H5, H5, the, that will change this X, all right? But imagine that, that we could change the policy of Python so that whenever we call H, it will actually change this X. Could be possible, right? So actually in the past, there were languages that would have this policy. So from inside G, you're accessing the X. But when you're calling, you're, 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 uh, you're constructing this H, which is the version of G where uh, X is 1, uh, right? But then whenever you execute um, G, execute H, you would actually look for the X which is closest to the place of use as opposed to the X that is closest to the place of definition, all right? So this was called dynamic scoping, and this was called static scoping. There's two types of scoping policies. Obviously, this is one in widespread use today. Do you know a language with dynamic scoping? That is still in reasonable use, reasonable level of usage today. It's Uh, what do you mean? Oh, you can't, because it hasn't been declared yet, right? But if so, so one possibility would be, right, that when you call this H, you would get 105 as a result, right? Because the G that you have declared here accesses this X. So this is called dynamic scoping. Dynamic scoping is a feature of LISP, right? 
So we don't find it in any of the languages we're discussing. But you should be aware that there are two types of scoping. OK? Whereas if you're accessing, so, so think, think, think of the principle. Right, I could be accessing the X that is closest to the place of use. This is the place of use. This is the closest X. That's dynamic scoping. Or I could be accessing the X that is closest to the place of definition. This is the definition. This is the X closest to the place of definition. And I could be accessing that X. That's static scope. OK? So that's the difference between static and dynamic scope. So if you build an interpreter, it turns out, if you build an interpreter as opposed to a compiler, uh, dynamic scoping is easier to implement. And it's quite likely that the that Lisp, which was the first, so the first two languages were Lisp and Fortran, developed pretty much at the same time in the 50s. Fortran had a compiler. They built a compiler for it. Lisp had an interpreter. So the first implementation of Lisp was via an interpreter. And Lisp turned out to have dynamic scoping. And then there was a big argument whether you know dynamic scoping is actually useful. They were trying to argue that it's not a bug, it's actually a feature, right? Uh, but you know, over 30 years, people have realized that you know not much of a feature, not not so useful. To, so so they did find some examples that were useful, uh, right? So so some advantage of dynamic scoping. But the world right now is, is um, all geared with um, static scoping. And LISP, his, for historical reason, is, reasons, is still dynamically uh, scoped. Uh, but that's because it's easier to build dynamic scoping inside an interpreter. But it's easier to build static scoping inside a compiler. Um, all right? So probably that those were the reasons. Any standard textbook on programming languages will have this topic, scoping, static scoping versus dynamic uh, scoping, even though there's no much, not much usage of uh, dynamic scoping today. OK, so last, uh, last topic for today is the language OZ. Uh, the main reason for introducing it here is um, that later I want to uh, show some concurrency examples that are uh, somewhat striking because of the concurrency model of OS, because of the combination of um, uh, elements that OS has. But we need to talk about the concurrency first. And I'm just going to introduce uh, OS so we can do a bit of it in the tutorial so you're better prepared uh, for the point in time when you actually, we actually need to uh, look at a concurrent example. So uh, it, it, uh, it tries to make Prolog more palatable. That was uh, their purpose. Um, they decided that the useful part of Prolog is Prolog style unification, right? But in modern programming languages, all of them allow higher order programming techniques, which, on, which don't do well in Prolog, which are not very well represented in Prolog. So they try to add uh, uh, higher order programming techniques specific of functional programming, functional languages. And it combines in a very interesting way stateful and non-stateful programming. Later, we'll see fine-grained concurrency model and some striking example on that. There's no implicit backtracking. Um, there, there's behavior that comes from concurrency, right? Whenever you have something that fails, that normally in Prolog you would think of, of failing, in uh, OS it blocks. And it can be unblocked by a separate thread. So this is something we won't be experiencing today. We still have terms as data, and actually, we, uh, we, the use of terms in, in OS is, is quite uh, prevalent. But uh, arithmetic expressions get evaluated and have value. So if you write 2 plus 3, that is 5, always, right? As opposed to prologue, where 2 plus 3 is 5 only sometimes, right? And there's no op declarations. We don't have the ability of changing the syntax. So similarities and dissimilarities, a few of them. Uh, variables are single assignment and must have capitalized names. All right, so still variables are capitalized. Variables must be declared you know, for scoping. And initially, they would be unbound. There are no predicates. We have procedures. 
Um, and they can be declared either as abstractions. So, so that's the standard, the standard way. That's the, the standard model. Procedures are abstract, and they are assigned to variables, right? And, and because of that, procedures name, procedure names are capitalized. So procedure names are actually variables whose value is a procedure, right? In the form of lambda something, right? Equality denotes inification still, but there's no failure. Either an exception is thrown if unification fails, but if you have a uh, unification that, who's, which, uh, that, that doesn't have a known outcome yet, the operation blocks, and it can only be unblocked by another draft. There's no backtrack. Uh, but you can mix you know, input and output as we did in prologue. So sometimes a variable may be, an argument can be used for input, sometimes it can be used for output. Um, so let's look at an example. Um, let me show you how the uh, environment works. The environment works via Emacs. So it's a bit... Um, It's a bit cumbersome. All right. Um, so if you have used the MIT scheme uh, interpreter, it works pretty much in the same uh, way. So uh, we can take a program from here. Let me see if I can cut and paste. And this is a procedure that performs append of two lists. All right, so once you have written your program in your buffer, uh, you can feed your buffer into the underlying or, or, uh, OS interpreter with control dot control B and it says accepted, and you get output in a separate window. Each browse statement here will produce a line of output. You see three browse statements, in fact, and the last one didn't go through because it has blocked. And it is in general, so this is an erroneous program, as a matter of fact. It is uh, erroneous to have a program with blocked threads, right, stopping with blocked threads. It must stop because it has reached the end. All the threads have reached, reached the end, right? So normally, we could have another thread unblocking the current thread and so on, but that's something that is going to be seen later. So let's look at this uh, uh, procedure quickly, right? Uh, so append, notice the fact that append is a <coughs> procedure name, but it's also capitalized, right? has two arguments, x, y, and r, like in prolog, and we're saying case x, it can be nil, so these are the possible values of a list, or h bar t. There's no brackets around h bar, bar t, as you know in prolog, but the bar is still there. So if x is nil, then the result should be equal to y. If x is h bar t, then we compute separately r, r1, right? And, and this is the declaration of r1. It's a bit strange, right? This is declaration of r1, and then we perform this call where R1 is used as a result of appending T to Y, and the result R is H bar R1, right? So it's a relatively straightforward trans uh, translation from Prolog, okay? Now, uh, how do we use this procedure? Well, this is a possible statement, right? It will bind R to the value of appending 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6. These variables have to be declared. This is their declaration. Just putting them there declares the variable. And then we can print R, and it will come out as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We can switch the roles of the second and third argument. I can use this one as input and this one as output, and it works fine. Right? So I can perform subtraction. This Z is going to be 4, 5, 6. Right? However, we can't switch the role. We can't apply that to the first argument. No longer, right? It used to be possible in prolog. No longer possible here. X is unbound. 
Therefore, we can't say whether it's nil or h bar t. Therefore, the current thread blocks. We only have one thread, right? And it, it remains blocks, blocked for the rest of the. So what could happen now is that a separate thread could come and bind this to something. And when that happens, the first thread is, un, is, uh, is unblocked. The simple fact of binding uh, this will allow this case statement to progress. And we'll see that later. It's, don't worry too much about that. I'm just telling you because you're, my, you might experience the behavior, so you'll be prepared to see what, what happens. All right. Uh, we're going to do examples about OS, but let's just go uh, very quickly through the elements. So um, the declared keyword declares top-level components. Right? We can also use local, uh, uh, and we, use, we, we declare local components. That's not so important at this point. Proc will uh, introduce a procedure definition. We have a procedure name and procedure arguments. Right? Then we have pattern matching, like we used to have in Prolog. It's very similar to the pattern matching in OCaml. All right? Then we have a scope definition. Right? So these variables and values Right, this computation will be valid only in this expression. As in functional programming, we don't need to explicitly return any value that uh, a, 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 the body of the function evaluates to becomes the return value. Right. So here, um, oh, if, if, if we need that, uh, we, we're not talking about functions. Right. So what happens here is that we're setting the result. All these three things are. Uh, uh, the, the, the purpose of the procedure is to create a relationship between these three variables. Um, all right, what else is there? So because of this in here, R1 will be a local variable. This app represents a recursive call. Uh, everything must be terminated with an end. So we start a statement end at the end, right? Global variables declared here because of the keyword declare here, right? And then the computation proceeds. We bind R to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The browse statement will print outside. All the statements are executed sequentially. Okay, this one, remember, it blocks, and that will be explained later. There's a lot of syntactic sugar, right? So instead of writing app x, y, r, we can write r equals app x, y. These two are absolutely equivalent. So whenever you're using functional notation, you can switch between functional notation and, and, and um, procedural notation, right? You just take this argument and put it as the last one, last argument of the procedure, and it's the same thing, right? Now, procedures can be declared as abstractions. So you see this is the lambda of OS, the dollar sign. So instead of saying procedure app x, y, r, we can say app, variable app is assigned or is, is bound to the procedure that has three arguments x, y, r, and the body here, right? So defining the name of a procedure is syntactic sugar for binding a procedure to a variable. And because of this, the first one, uh, the first equivalence. The second equivalence is also uh, possible, right? So I can define a function. Instead of defining a procedure, I can define a function, app, right? And I can return a value. And when we define functions, this is what the body of the procedure evaluates to, and that will be the return value of the entire function. And it can also be declared as an abstraction. Okay? And we can switch between fun and proc. Okay? We can switch between fun and proc. Uh, as we please. Now, the interesting thing is stateful programming. So, uh, OS uses a two layered storage, right? Because these are variables, these are single assignment variables as they were in Prolog. Once they get a value, that value never changes. But guess what? The value of a variable, say p, can become a cell 
right? So P is bound to the address of that cell, and the value of P will never change. Will will continue to be bound to the address of that cell. But that the address of that cell points to a cell whose content is actually mutable. All right. So P being a reference, it fulfills the role of a single assignment variable. Doesn't change that address ever again. But the contents of the address can change. Right? And, and this trick uh, uh, makes stateful and non-stateful pro programming combine in a very elegant way. All right? So this is how we create a new cell. The return value from this procedure call is the address of the cell, which is bound to P, and P will never change. All right? But we can access, with this operator, we can access and change the contents of the cell. So we're dereferencing P, finding out where that cell is, and assigning to it. And this at P will dereference the, chain, the, the cell and return the contents. So we can pretty much have assignment as we please, right? And this is a factorial function, right? Where we have a variable P initialized with one. We have a helper procedure, right? If N is zero, then skip. Notice that if doesn't have, we don't have single branch if. All ifs are if then else. All right? And uh, whenever we don't want to use a branch, we have to write skip in there, which is the instruction that does nothing. So if n is 0, we skip. Nothing to do. Otherwise, we multiply p by n. So p is assigned the contents of p times n. And then we recurse into helper n minus 1. Right? So this would be computational factorial in a procedure manner. Note that there is no while statement or for statement in ALS. So even though we have assignment, we still have to resort to recursion to produce iterative computation. Okay? And this will be the return value here. Right? So all this is local. Notice the in keyword. So all this is local. Right? The scope of these definitions that we have made here are only inside here. So we call the procedure, we return the value, and that's the value that the factorial returns. We're going to do several examples in the tutorial. Okay? This is all for today. We want to experience the combination of stateful and non-stateful programming in us. Okay, thanks for coming. See you next time.